Hello everybody, my name is Fiona Banger, I'm the Treasurer for QSight uh, Queensland, I'm also the Secretary of the QSight Gold Coast Chapter. Um, with Jenny, Alex and myself as the core, um, with a number of others who turn up, we're, we're more than happy to welcome you into uh, our conference for today and tomorrow. I'd like to introduce to you our first keynote speaker, Peter Grant. Peter is the first CEO level state chief information officer in Australia and the first to report directly to a minister. Peter is responsible for information and communication technology project management, policy development and implementation and workforce across the Queensland Government. With extensive experience spanning public and private private sector roles, Peter's 35 plus year IT career highlights include being a founding director of consulting for Gartner Asia Pacific, co-founding technology startup Ozone Systems, consulting to federal government and working as Queensland State Director for Microsoft. Peter is an adjunct professor of information systems with the University of Queensland and Queensland University of Technology and a fellow of the Australian Computer Society. For any further ado, welcome. Very much. I'll just line up with this microphone so it works. Look, uh, it's my pleasure to be here this afternoon. I'm, uh, it's uh, it's a little daunting because I'm in a room full of expert presenters. So I talk to people all the time about IT, but I don't know that I talk to a group who uh, I'd have to look up to with your skills of being able to communicate. Um, it's, it's been a nice week, I've got a blue tie on. That's not because I'm supporting New South Wales, it's because I'm flying there later on and I didn't want to rub it in too much. Uh, I, I, for, for those of you who know me, the, the last day of origin every year I wear a football jumper to work with a Queensland Guernsey. And I think I chaired a couple of board meetings with it yesterday. People were a little bit put out by that, but uh, that's a tradition I use. One had a minister in it, so I don't back off on this tradition for anything. Uh, I've got about half an hour to talk to you about the, uh, the IT industry and where it's going and what that means for education. Can't cover all of that in half an hour, but there's a good friend of mine, Simon Kaplan, who's going to speak later on, and he is at the back there at that booth uh, with a whole bunch of uh, collateral material that, uh, that he can hand out to you as well. Um, let me kick off. Uh, I guess. One of the reasons I'm here today is that we have a big problem in the IT industry employing the right skills. And there just aren't people out there with the skill sets that we're looking forward to having. And there's a few reasons for that, and I'm going to cover them in this talk. Uh, the industry is changing quite dramatically, it has been doing so for a little while. I, I, I looked at the all of the kerfuffle about the media and Fairfax and these companies of, uh, of recent times and I've, I've looked at these media executives going, gee, this internet thing has really only happened in the last little while. Um, and uh, you look at them and just shake your head and think, you know, you've just missed the bus for a decade. Uh, but unfortunately, the IT industry is a bit the same. Uh, and, uh, and that goes right back through the entire supply chain for people in IT. We've got to have a good think about who and who we need working in the industry and what skills they need in future. And it keeps changing. And, and so my talk today is about that change. So one of the things that I will touch on during this talk a couple of times is the impact of the change in what I call media. So, so on the way in we were having a chat and I pulled out my phone and I said, currently all the music I've ever bought I can access from this phone. So on the way down here in the car, I played a bit of rock and roll. Uh, it all came down from the cloud on my phone and into the car. Now, so what that means is that I don't have to manage the media for that music anymore. If you think about it, there was a time in my lounge room I had a huge piece of furniture and it was full of CDs. And there was a time before that I had a huge piece of furniture full of LPs. And I had all sorts of specialised gear that I could only use in my lounge room to play that music. Now I can play that music anywhere at all. Managing the media is becoming a non-event. It's not what we do. 
But uh, let me kick this off by saying that probably at the moment in the IT industry, 80% of the jobs we have are managing media. They're going. We won't be doing that in the, in the future. So what's the real purpose of the industry if our job isn't managing media? And if you want me to look at your own life, if you're doing the same thing with music as me, you're not managing your music media either anymore in the same way that you did before. So let's, let's kick off and we'll talk about what that means in the context of this talk. 2001 to 2007, we had a bit of a drama in the industry. We did some careful analysis of this over that time. There was a 73% reduction in the number of people going to uni requesting IT as their first preference. This was right across Australia. In Queensland, that uh, translated into a, a gap by about 2008 of 4,500 people not being in the IT industry when at the beginning of that decade we expected that they would be. That couldn't keep happening. So uh, a bunch of uh, myself and a number of universities got together around 2006. We created a group called Group X, which Simon Kaplan can talk to you about later on at the, uh, at the stand at the back there. And one of the things we did was to try and focus on explaining to young people why they should be in IT. And this is what happened as a result of that. So from 2007 on, that blue line represents the growth in the number of first uh, place offers for IT in Queensland universities. So it's actually gone back up um, by more than 70%. But have a look at the other lines. The, um, if, I, if I look at the, uh, the green line down there, I'm sorry, the yellow line down there, that's what's happened for all of the rest of the nation in terms of people going to uni to do IT. So from, the, from what you would consider a disaster, where it went down by 73%, the rest of the nation has continued to go down another 10%. In Queensland, we've made a big effort to explain to young people what it means to be in IT, and we've got that line back up. We're the only place in the nation who's done it. So there's a number of things that I'm going to talk about today that uh, explain how we've done that, and, there's, uh, and you can talk to, to Simon and his group for the rest of the conference, and they will have uh, collateral material to explain how that's happened. So this is, uh, this is fairly significant. We've done the best we can do to get the rest of Australia to listen to us and they won't and they're continuing on that yellow line, but for the industry's point of view that's not so great. So why is there a lack of, of interest in IT? And these are some of the things I'd like to cover. First of all, we've got a branding problem. We're really poor at describing what we do. So if you go to a party, I used to hate this when I was younger, people say, what do you do? Oh, I'm in IT. The next thing they do is they whip out their PC and say, it's broken, can you fix this for me? Uh, and they really don't understand all of the things that, uh, that we do. Uh, I'm going to cover these in the talk, but there's a whole bunch of myths around, around IT. You know, the, this is a boring job, you don't deal with people, you know, you sit in front of a PC all day. Well, that's completely wrong, of course, and you know that, but, but that's what the community think. There will be people out there who argue that IT is not a professional discipline. Gee, everyone's got spreadsheets, so they do IT, so it can't be a professional discipline. What's really interesting about that is that Harvard and MIT and Cranfield University all think it's a professional discipline because they've got uh, degrees and postgraduate quals you can get in IT. Um, the other one is that failures tend to get all the airtime. So even in the Queensland government, a vast majority of things we work on work. Uh, a couple of them don't. They make the press and continue to do so for years and years and years. Um, and probably the final one that's a real big problem for all of us, and we probably need your help with this, is that school children are not exposed to potential IT career paths. So we've actually done surveys of them, and they'll come back and they'll say, well, I don't want to work in IT. I've seen the person fixing the PC in the lab in my classroom, and that, I don't want that job. And I said to a couple of them once, if you saw a guy fixing a pothole outside on the road, would that stop you being a civil engineer? And they went, no. And I went, well, it's what you're basically saying to me about an IT career. 
But alchemy is a abstract, and so they can't, they can't see that, they can't understand it. So here's some myths. The first one is you need to be good at maths. Um, for some things we do in IT, you definitely need to be good at maths, but this is a very, very broad industry, and there's a whole bunch of things, and I'll talk to you about them later, that we do, that don't require you to have any maths at all. And we need a number of people still to have those sorts of characteristics in our industry. So there are things that we do that are engineering based in IT, that's really good, you need some maths. But there are things we do in the social science um, where we don't need you to have that as a prerequisite. So, uh, and if you think about the gender imbalance we have in IT, I think this is one of the key things that we're on. Um, as I said about working in front of a PC, although all of the jobs that go to India is, uh, is another one that drives me nuts that the press talk about. The killer, the killer roles that we're looking for in IT at the moment in government, and I'll talk about those later, are all in the social sciences. You can't outsource to another country social science type activities and communication. You can't do that. Uh, it's not going to work. The pay isn't so good is another, um, and I'll cover this one as well, uh, but just to give you a, an introduction to that. At the moment, in Canberra, if you've got five years experience in large-scale IT project management and you want to be a contractor, your rate will be around $2,000 a day. So, you know, please don't tell them the pay's no good, that's $10,000 a week. Uh, and that's for people with five years' experience. So, uh, but that's a social science type job, and hardly anyone can figure out that we that, that we do that. Uh, and um, people who use a computer at work must be in IT. So, you know, they see somebody basically doing data entry, and they think that's my job. So, uh, and decide not to do it. There's a whole bunch of myths like this out there, and until we get rid of those, it's giving our industry a real problem in terms of branding. Um, the span of the discipline covers these things. In IT we do architecture. Uh, we, it's a social science discipline. But we work in the hard sciences as well, where we do need mathematical skills. Uh, we work across business uh, and engineering. It's all of those things. Uh, it's all of those disciplines. There's a role for someone in every one of those. And the problem is that the community only know about probably the engineering and science ones. Uh, so we've come up with this, and there's, uh, there's some handouts on this at the back. We've come up with a model of career streams in IT. I'm just going to cover these briefly. We think there's four different career streams in IT. The key to this is these are uniquely different as engineering has different career streams. So if I go and study to be a civil engineer, there's no way I can go and design an aeroplane. I'm not an aeronautical engineer. If I go and study to be an aeronautical engineer, I'm pretty sure that I won't be allowed to be an electrical engineer, uh, or I won't be allowed to design bridges. It's the same in IT. There are different career streams, and they are underpinned by different theory. So if you're going to uni, there's different theory that you need to know to work in those particular career streams. So the first one is building technology. So if I, if I talk about that as a career stream, its orientation is engineering. Uh, what we're going to do there is write software, design hardware, build, build kit. Now today, this is not as valued as it was 15 or 20 years ago. I worked in this career stream, and at the time, I don't know if you might remember, there was a time when Paul Keating was the treasurer and he forgot to do his income tax return. It was about 1985, I think. And so, as a result of doing that, he, got, he made the paper, and someone put his income tax return in the, in the paper. I was actually working in this field, and uh, a few of us were sitting around in a coffee shop one morning reading the newspaper going, gee, he's the treasurer, I wouldn't do that job, it doesn't pay well enough. Now, that is not the case today. This field doesn't get paid as well as that anymore. And, uh, one of the reasons for that is that there's not a lot of new things that we need to build. Quite a lot of the stuff that we didn't have in the mid-80s, we actually have now, and we're making incremental changes to it, but there isn't a vast amount of new things to get. And they're, they're, they're available as commodities. So, as, as an example, 
In Canberra a couple of years ago, the federal government started a new department. It was the Department of uh, Climate Change. When the uh, Climate Change and Energy Efficiency, when that department was started, all of the IT that was required for the whole department was set up using shrink wrap software. Software that you can buy out of a box and set up and use. All of it. They didn't write anything. So they had no demand to write software. And that's just how it is. So, so if I had set up a new department in Canberra in the mid 80s, I would have had to write everything. I would have had to write a document management system and I would have had to write finance system and everything would have had to have been written. That department, brand new department, set up in, I think, 2008, everything in there that ran came out of a box that you could buy. So um, as a result of this, the, the, that income in that area has gone down. The theory that you need to do that job is um, along the lines of relational calculus. We need to know about algorithms, data structures, valid things to know. You've just got to be a little careful about the length of the, the, the career that you're going to have in that space. There will be some, but they won't be as many as there were before. Um, there is an incorrect perception out there as well that if you're going to get into IT, you have to do this as a prerequisite. That's not true. Uh, and that's actually stopping a lot of people getting into the social science side of IT where we need them today. So the next one is running technology. The next career stream. Running technology has a service orientation. So I arrived here today and people helped me put, set up my slides on here. And then those, those people are providing a service to this organisation. So running technology is about a $2 billion business in Queensland. Every organisation has someone there whose, whose job it is to run and maintain the infrastructure for IT in their organisation. Um, Typical salaries uh, are probably better than the software development ones um, and the theory that underpins that is a completely different set of theory that you'd be studying at university than what you'd study if you were doing engineering software development. It's completely different. Uh, so ITIL, there's IT infrastructure library, there's infrastructure optimization, which is a whole bunch of theory put together by Microsoft on how to uh, run your infrastructure better. There's uh, a lot of work around security because we want organisations to be secure, capacity planning, procurement, contract management, so it's not in the algorithms and data centre space. Um, these roles will continue to be run in-house. You're just going to, you're going to have these types of jobs forever. The, final, the next one is trans, transforming business. And this is where we think the industry is going. So in this particular area, we're talking about managing change. And if you think about what we've done in IT, that's what we do. We actually come up with new innovative ways of doing things and then we have to get organisations to change. Uh, and in there, this is where I was saying that the salaries for specific jobs um, tend to be well over 100K. These parallel more, actually. If you're, if you're looking for a career in here, your income potential is about the same scale as where people will uh, make money and more. Um, a whole different set of theories, um, project management body of knowledge, benefits management methodologies, uh, business process management, process modelling, a whole bunch of social science type issues. This particular area is one of the areas in government where we have a massive skill shortage. So, uh, and across Australia, people are being well and truly overpaid in these roles. $2,000 a day for people with five years' experience is not an unusual outcome here. Um, and unfortunately, when we talk to students at school, none of them see this as an IT role, um, and so we just miss out on them all seeing it as a valid career path. Um, the final one is designing the enterprise. Uh, and this is an architectural role. Uh, the orientation is around architecting things. If you think about it, I can, I can explain this this way. In Queensland Health, in a given hospital, there are 6,000 different IT applications. For that hospital to work synergistically, they all have to be designed to work together. Otherwise, if they were all just put in randomly, no one would be able to do anything at all in the hospital. So someone has to have a role of actually designing how all of these things fit together. It's a little bit like the architect designing your house. 
Um, the people who make the most out of this are organisations like banks. Banks in the early 90s grew through acquisition and ended up buying a whole bunch of other financial management companies. When they did that, they ended up with dozens and dozens and dozens of IT systems that didn't look at customers holistically. So you could have a million dollars in a bank account and go into the same bank and say, I'd like to uh, get a loan for a new car, and they wouldn't even know that you had money in the account because it was in another system. Um, I was actually part of a recruitment team when I worked for Gartner to find the head of architecture for a large Australian bank. And when we were interviewing the executives, one of them said to me, do you think if we paid this person $500,000 a year that we'd be able to get good applicants? So that's what we're talking about in terms of the value of these roles, an IT job. Typical salaries really are here are by negotiation. Um, you know, 300k would be the bottom end of what anyone would be making in, in this area. Uh, and the theory that we're talking about looks like this. So you can find all, you'll have a copy of my slides, you'll be able to find this theory really easily on the internet. But uh, COVID, uh, the, uh, the Zekman framework, TOGAF, would be, the, would be the key ones that I'd recommend that you look at. And that is the theory that the people in these roles use to actually understand and design how organisations work. So uh, this is totally invisible to students. I'm sure you'll have students on work experience who go and work for an architect somewhere in, business, in, in building industry, but there's no way that I've, could, well, I've ever found a student who's actually been and spent some time in work experience with an enterprise architect. But this is, the, this, this is a, a hugely important role in IT. In the Queensland Government, we actually publish uh, this particular model, which we can hand out to you out the back, down the back. And it basically shows those career streams and the types of jobs that are in them. So that uh, you, can, you can actually go to our website, and there's details on the slides here that you can look at the website, you can actually get a drill down on what these jobs mean. And I think it's really important that we all can share that sort of information with each other because if, if we can't show students that these careers exist, they'll never choose IT as a, as a discipline. Let me, let me just talk to you for a minute about where the roles are changing. Um, I've been in the IT industry actually, my bio is wrong, it's actually 39 years, I actually hate hearing that because it's making me feel pretty old. But, um, I've been in, the IT long, in IT long enough to have seen every one of these changes, step changes in how the industry has worked. And every one of these step changes has driven quite a significant change in the types of jobs people do, what skills they need, and where they fit in the industry. So in the 1960s, the first major change was the, was the invention of the IBM 360. This computer was called three, the 360 because of its 360 degree view of how it, it ran in organisations. It's the first computer to actually be able to run, in theory, two programs at the same time. It's the first one to use external peripherals like printers and things that, uh, that you could interchange with the, with the system. It was the beginning of the mainframe era and people still use these 20 years later. Uh, what sort of people did we need in the IT industry then? You had to have lots of people to write software because there wasn't any. You had to have lots of people in white coats to make this work because it was an ongoing engineering exercise to do it. Uh, these days my iPhone's got more power than that had and I don't need anyone to look after that. The brakes are thrown away and get another one. Now, by the 1970s, we had the advent of what we call the mini computer and this was departmental computing. And this actually put computers in the hands of departments in business. So in that era, we had a whole bunch of computers make their way into marketing and they made their way into HR and they made their way into areas that the mainframe could never get to because it was too expensive. Um, this drove the development of a hot and, and word processing appeared in that era, not in the PC era, era. It actually had appeared then and it drove a change in the way organisations worked. Um, then in the 1990s, through some good marketing from Sun Computing and Microsoft, we got client-server computing. When that came out, everyone who worked in the mini-computer industry suddenly didn't have a job. 
that was a radical change in the industry. I know people who were on huge salaries being experts at many computers in driving cabs six months later. This was a radical shift in the way things worked. Um, by 2000, um, we had the internet becoming quite mainstream, which has had a, an impact on client server computing, but internet basically gave us the opportunity to have cloud. My experience in the industry and the history that I've seen here is going to show me that if you're an expert at client server, cloud is going to do to you what client server did to the mini computer industry. It's going to take them out. So there will be a massive change in the way organisations work. I, I spent some time two years ago now in the US at the Paul Allen Computer Science Research Center in the uh, University of Washington in Seattle. And the professors over there had agreed that within five years, and that's two years ago, any organisation that had an in-house server was wasting money. And my view will probably be that within 10 years, no one will be managing in-house servers. It will just be uh, completely blown out of the water in the same way the client server group blew the mini computer group out of the water. So what's that mean to our career streams? The well, cloud is really the big shift. Uh, in the Queensland government, we just shut down an in-house email initiative. We we're going to provide email to 200,000 public servants and an internal cost of around $16 per person per month. 16 multiplied by 12 multiplied by 200,000. Uh, we can now do that if we go to the cloud for around $3 per person per month and it's a better service and I don't have to buy any capital uh, and if I don't like it I can switch to someone else. Uh, there is just no argument. You know, it's a saving of 13 multiplied by 12 multiplied by 200,000. Plus I don't have to buy any capital, invest in any capital or equipment. Um, so it is uh, there, there's just a debate in terms of how that's going to happen. The, the other point about the no, uh, no servers, the other point that I didn't mention in there is there won't be any local area networks either. So, uh, you know, within 10 years, in my view, that's, uh, that's pretty safe. The reason I said sooner in the US is because in the US they have a thing called the global financial crisis. And the global financial crisis created what I would term a, 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 something called economic Darwinism. They had to make changes and take risks to do it. Um, we're not having a global financial crisis in Australia, but governments are rapidly running out of money. And I think when you see the impact of that, we're going to start taking a few more risks to do things as well. And we'll probably find, you know what, there aren't that big of risks uh, to, uh, to make these changes. They, they, don't, they haven't had any problems in the US doing it. Software as a service is another, is another way of thinking about this. And a quick analogy here would be, I did some work two years ago for a federal government department, and one of their business groups came up to them and they said, we're running a six-week review and we need to have access to a complaints management system. Now, one of the complaints I have about tertiary education in IT is we don't teach people about the anatomy of business systems. So when these people heard the word complaints management system, they didn't know what it meant. You know, if I went up to someone who graduated from medicine and said, I think I've broken this bone in my arm, I don't know which one it is, they'd go, that's your radius bone, and that's your ulna, and that's your humerus, and they just know all that. But if I say to someone who's got a degree in IT, I need a complaints management system, very few of them actually understand that's part of a class, a class of systems called customer relationship management. The question they had to ask was, do we have any customer relationship management systems in our organisation? And they, they didn't know to ask that. They actually had three different packages that did that. So these guys went away and started writing software to build one. But it was to support an initiative that was only going to go for three to six weeks. So you could never write one in that time. So what were their options? Their options were to know that it was a customer relationship management component. Do I have one of those? Let's use that. But their other option was to go and buy it as a software as a service. So they didn't do that. Software as a service you can buy from both Microsoft or Salesforce.com 
$30 a month per person, you can have it in 10 minutes. You get it from the internet uh, and you can sign up with a credit card and you have a compliance management system in 10 minutes. By the time I found these guys writing the software, they'd spent $15,000 and I'm going to take another six weeks to even get to the specifications right. It's just the wrong way of doing it. Right? It's, uh, the, the way to do it is, it's available anyway, we're not going to build it, we're going to buy it. The Queensland Government has a share before, buy before, build policy. You've got to go through me and my minister to get approval to write code for anything. And our first response will be, can you buy it? And if you can, then don't come and ask me, because I'm never going to say yes. Because building it yourself is really expensive, takes a long time, probably doesn't work, and then we have to maintain it forever. If I can buy it for $30 a month, I'll have it that way. Um, so we really have to think about stop, stopping training people working in the older paradigms, because um, we're not working in those paradigms anymore. We're, we're working in a different set of paradigms to that. Um, so if I look at those career streams, what's becoming a commodity is building and running technology. What is becoming more important is using easily available technology that's low cost to transform how we do businesses. And we need to be able to identify innovation opportunities and we need to be good at design to do that. So um, I'm going to wrap up this pretty quickly now because we, we don't have a lot of time here and I'm going to leave a lot of these slides behind. One of the things that I want to separate here that I think is an important thing to think about is should we be teaching students how to do technology, which is really the left hand side of this model, or should we be teaching them why we do technology, which is the right hand side of that model? Because transforming enterprises is why we're doing it. But if I, I, do a, I do a lecture to students at QUT twice a year, they're the first lecture they get in IT when they start at uni, and I sit there and I ask them, all of them every time, why do we do IT? I never get anyone answer it correctly. I never even get an answer that makes sense. And, and the problem is, they've just decided to dedicate three years of their life and a whole bunch of X to learn the discipline, and they can't tell me why we do it. So how can we possibly get to that point and make that decision without understanding that. So, um, I think we do it to transform business. I think we do it to actually lock in good business processes that, that avoids corruption. I think we do it to improve decision making in organisations. That's why I need access to information. We do it to improve communication. And we do it for education and entertainment. Um, I never get, I never, I've done this every year, twice a year for five years with 300 people each time, it's not a bad sample. I've never got any one of those ever in an answer. So, uh, and I've never got anything like it, it's generally I'm doing it so I can run a server for someone or I'm doing it so I can write some software or I'm doing it, that's not why we do it, that's how we do it. So when do we teach them why we do it? Um, I think I'll leave you with this. I think the future of the industry has got three different types of careers. I think we need a whole bunch of people looking around in organisations going, how can we do things better? How can we take those principles that underpin why we do IT and make everything better? And, and you know what? We've done this for 50 years, but we just do it by blind luck because we don't have anyone in those jobs. So someone just comes along and goes, oh, I figured a good idea out for doing this, and that becomes something really important for the organisation, but it's just luck. When they come up with that good idea, quite often they fail because we don't have people trained in design. So we don't have people trained to design these things properly, fit them in with the rest of the architecture for the organisation. And then, in the end, we need people with skills in implementation. If I looked at the current skills force I've got in the Queensland Government, 85 to 90% of them are all brilliant at managing media, which isn't on that list. Uh, it's not there. Uh, so what I, what I need them to be able to do is help me be a better organisation. So there's a lot of ways that you can help us, and I'll leave you with this. You, um, you've, got a, you've got a lot of uh, opportunity to provide inspirational messages to students. 
to, to talk to them about where, where the IT is going, the IT industry is going, and what their careers might be like. And Simon Kaplan and the group at the back can really help you with that if you look at some of their equipment. Uh, we'd like to make a whole bunch of people excited about these types of careers. Innovation, design, social science, implementation is a good thing to, uh, to actually know about. So we're in the innovation and technology industry from now on. Let's go change things. Thank you very much for, for having me here.